Good morning and once again welcome back to NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston as we continue to take a look at the STS-131 mission and Discovery's upcoming flight to the International Space Station. Here now to give us more details about all the spacewalks that are planned for this flight is the lead spacewalk officer for this mission, David Cohen. Go ahead, Dave. Good morning, my name is David Cohen, I'm the EVA lead for STS-131. We'll be doing uh, three spacewalks on the mission. Uh, our primary objective being to changing out the starboard ammonia tank assembly. Uh, we changed out the port ammonia tank on uh, STS-128, so we'll be doing the other one on this one. And that's going to take us about, uh, we'll, take, we'll take us three EVAs. Uh, the ammonia tank itself is uh, roughly actually the size and weight of a first generation smart car, so it's a fairly big box we'll be changing out. So we'll be using the, the robotic arm to do that. We'll be using the arm, all three EVAs. Uh, just uh, real quickly before we get into the EVAs, uh, our crew is going to be uh, Rick Mastracchio will be our EV-1 wearing the uh, red stripe. This is actually his third space flight. He's done uh, three EVAs before on STS-118. Uh, EV-2 wearing the white stripes will be Clay Anderson. He's also done three EVAs. He was an Expedition 15 crew member, so this will be his second flight. And he actually did two of those EVAs with the STS-118 crew. So Rick and Clay are very experienced crew members and actually experienced at doing EVAs together. <clears throat> Dottie Metcalf Lindenberger will be our uh, intravicular activity crew member, so our task IV, and she will be choreographing the day and taking the EV crew uh, through the procedures. And Jim Dutton, who's the pilot on the flight, will be our suit IV, so he'll be responsible for suiting up Rick and Clay uh, into their spacesuits before the uh, spacewalks and getting them out after the spacewalks. So we can take a look at uh, the EVA-1 video. The crew will start off, uh, as we do all EVAs from Space Station, from the joint airlock. So the brick will be egressing first. And the first thing he's going to do is head up to the old starboard ammonia tank, and he's going to grab a fixed grapple bar, which you see flashing in blue. He's going to unbolt that from the old ammonia tank, and he'll actually take this over to the payload bay. And we'll be using this fixed grapple bar. This is what allows the, uh, the station robotic arm to grapple the ammonia tank. Like I said before, we'll be uh, using the robotic arm to move the ammonia tank for all three EVAs since it's so big and heavy. So Rick will grab that fixed grapple bar and he'll translate down space station. He will do a tether swap to a second safety tether on the Japanese experiment module. Then he'll head down to the payload bay. And once he gets there, he's going to go aft in the payload bay and he's going to temporarily stow that FGB, that fixed grapple bar, on the LMC, and the LMC is a platform that we're used to launch the new ammonia tank, which is the big white box there. While he's doing that, Clay's going to follow him out of the airlock, and Clay will also head up to the old starboard ammonia tank, and he is going to disconnect the nitrogen lines and the ammonia lines that go to that ammonia tank. This is just in preparation for EVA2 when we actually swap out this tank. So once he's done disconnecting those four lines, he'll put the, the thermal cover back over them. He'll go to the forward side of the truss uh, to a CETA cart. CETA cart is a mobile EVA work platform that we use. And he's going to grab an articulating portable foot restraint, or just a foot restraint, uh, from that CETA cart, put it on his body restraint tether, and he'll take that to the payload bay. So on his way there, uh, just as Rick did, uh, Clay will do a tether swap to a second tether to allow him to reach the payload bay, except he'll do it on top of the node 2 module. And then he'll head down and meet Rick in the payload bay at the LMC. And once he's at the LMC, Clay's going to install his foot restraint into a worksite interface, or a WIF. And while Clay's doing that, Rick is going to bolt that fixed grapple bar to the side of the ammonia tank. You can see the fixed grapple bar is flashing in blue here. So bolt that on, and this is, again, what the arm will use to grapple the ammonia tank so we can move it. <coughs> Simultaneously, Clay uh, will be installing that foot restraint into the LMC. Once he gets it installed, he will pop into it, and Rick and Clay will then unbolt the four bolts that hold the ammonia tank to the LMC, and they'll pick it up out of the soft docks and hand it to the arm, where the arm's going to grapple it. Once the arm has it, uh, Clay's going to remove his foot restraint off the LMC. He's going to take it out of the payload bay and put it on node 2 and just leave it there until he needs it again on EVA 3. 
And while he's doing that, Rick is going to be translating out to the Japanese experiment module, to the exposed facility on it, where he's going to retrieve uh, the impact seed experiment. And impact seed is a materials experiment that the Japanese have out there. So he'll go out, and you see it flashing in blue there, and he'll install a cover on it to protect the experiment. Then he'll take it off and put it on his body restraint tether. Here's some MBL footage of him unbolting it. And the experiment itself is what's in his left hand. So he's using his pistol grip tube to, tool to undo the bolts on it. And then he'll pop the experiment off, put it on his BRT, and take it to the airlock. And again, the impact seat is what just came off there. So he'll translate back down the Japanese module, back down space station to the airlock, and he's just going to temporarily stow the impact seat on the outside of the airlock until he puts it inside the airlock at a later time. And while this is happening, the arm is moving the new ammonia tank that we it just took from the EV crew in the payload bay over to the external storage platform 2, or ESP2, which is just outside the airlock. And Rick and Claire are going to meet the arm there. They're going to take an adjustable grapple bar off of the spare flex hose rotor coupler, or FHRC, and they're going to mount this grapple bar to the ATA. Here's some MBL footage of them installing that onto the ATA. And basically, uh, the this is going to be used for the uh, POA, which is the payload ORU accommodation device on the uh, mobile platform, or the, uh, the mobile transporter. Uh, it has an end effector just like the arm, so the robotic arm will fly the ATA over to the POA, and actually the POA will then grapple this adjustable grapple bar, and then the arm will release the ATA, and we'll leave it there between EVA 1 and 2. While that's happening, uh, Clay is going to come inside to the forward part of the truss here, and he's going to unbolt two bolts on a rate gyro assembly. So the RGA is another box the crew will be changing out. It's bolted, it has two bolts on the inside of the truss and then two bolts on the outside of the truss. So while Clay is on the inside on the forward side of the truss, Rick will go get the spare RGA and come to the back side of the truss. And he's going he's to temp stow the, the bag that has that RGA in it, the new one. Then he'll configure the work site so he can pull out the old one. He'll move that flashing piece of equipment if he needs to get it out of the way. Then he'll open up the thermal blanket. He'll unbolt the failed or the old RGA and pull it out. And here's some MBL footage of him pulling that out. It's a little bit smaller than an ATA. So he'll temp so that just above him, and he'll grab the new one from the bag he brought out with him, install the new one, uh, put the old one in the bag, and then clean up the work site. Put the thermal blanket back over the RGA and put any equipment back that he had to move to gain access to it. When he's done installing the new RGA, he's going to take the old one that's in the bag now and take it to the forward side of the truss and just temporarily stow it there, and he'll leave it and pick it up on his way inside the airlock later on. Once he attempts to it, he's going to go inside the truss and install the two bolts that Clay had removed on the old one. So while Rick is doing this, Clay's going to be heading out to the far port side of the truss, so heading all the way out to P6. And he'll be doing some work for the next flight for STS-132. They're changing out batteries on the P6 truss segment. There's already two foot restraints and two gap spanners that the crew uses to do the, the r and of the batteries. They were out there for the last crew that did the one side of the batteries, so STS-132 will do the other side. So Clay's going to grab one of those foot restraints and one of the gap spanners from one side of the truss. He's just going to move around to the other side of the truss. So battery uh, remove and replace takes, is quite time consuming, so anything we can do to help the next crew get started on that is uh, something they appreciated. So we'll install the gas spinner and install the foot restraint. As soon as Rick is done uh, with his last two bolts on the rate gyro assembly, he will head out to P6 also, and he will grab a second foot restraint and a second gas spanner, and he will also move those to the other side of the P6 truss segment. While Rick is doing that, Clay is going to actually start uh, breaking torque on uh, both bolts on all six batteries. So he's going to release the bolt by one turn and then just lightly tighten it up again. These bolts were launched with fairly high torque. Uh, and to help the next crew with their change out to go as fast as possible, they're just going to loosen up those bolts a little bit so things go quicker for them. And here's an animation of Rick installing his gap spanner. So I'll have two gas spanners running across the series of batteries and then two foot restraints for the next crew to use. And 
And on their way uh, after this task, if they have time, uh, the crew will mate a connector between P4 and P5. This allows ammonia to flow out to the P5, uh, P6 segment. Uh, but only if we have time, it'll be get ahead for them. Uh, after that, they will clean up everything and head back inside uh, to the airlock, which will conclude EVA1. Uh, the crew will have a day in between EVA 1 and 2, and the arm, I'm sure you heard before in the other uh, briefing, will walk off between the EVAs. This will allow the arm to have access to the actual old uh, ATA worksite. And so the, the main thing for EVA 2 will be the actual swapping of the old ammonia tank with the new ammonia tank. So if we take a look at the video for the next EVA. So on EVA 2, uh, clay is actually going to be coming out first. And the first thing they'll do is wrinkle head up to the old ammonia tank. And he's going to grab a foot restraint from the airlock. It's flashing in blue there. He's going to put it just below the old ammonia tank. And he's going to ingress it. Clay will go up and meet him at the ammonia tank. And they'll undo the four bolts that hold it in, into the truss and lift it up. Here's some MBL footage of Rick lifting it off the truss. It's a pretty big box, so they move it pretty slowly. They'll hand it off to the arm. And the arm will grapple a fixed grapple bar that's already on top of the ammonia tank. And the arm's going to maneuver the ammonia tank away from the truss and to the forward side of the truss. So Rick and Clay will follow the arm from the back side to the forward side. And on his way, Rick's going to uncouple a CETA cart from the mobile transporter. And he's going to move that CETA cart outboard or away from the mobile transporter. And he's going to configure it so they can use it to stow the old ammonia tank. Basically, he's going to fold the brake handles down and fold the foot restraints clear, make it as clear as possible, as flat as possible. While he's doing that, the arm's going to start maneuvering the old ammonia tank close to the seat of cart. And Rick and Clay will get in position on either side of the seat of cart there. And when the uh, ammonia tank gets close enough, they will attach six adjustable equipment tethers to the old ATA and tie it down to the seat of cart. And they're just going to leave it tied down here uh, for two or three hours while they install the new ATA. And you can see the equipment tethers flashing in blue there. So during, while this is happening, the uh, arm's going to go get the new ammonia tank that it temp stowed in the POA on EVA-1. It takes them a little bit of time to do that. So Rick and Clay are going to translate to the bottom side of the port P1 segment. And they're going to install radiator grapple fixture stowage beams, two of them, on the actual port radiator beam. And these small beams that are flashing blue there are used to temp stow a grapple fixture that we'd use if we ever had to change out a radiator in the future. So that'll take them about half an hour, give the arm enough time to grab that new ammonia tank out of the POA and maneuver it down to the truss just a little bit inboard of the old ammonia tank. We're going to get that adjustable grapple bar that they put on on EVA1, take it off, and just temp stow it in the truss. While they're doing that, the arm's going to maneuver that new ammonia tank to the backside of S1 to the work site where they can install it. And Rick and Clay will follow the arm along. So they'll get set up in the same position where they release the old ammonia tank. And the arm will drive the ammonia tank in close to them. They'll take control over it. The arm will release the ammonia tank. And Rick and Clay will bring it into soft dock. Here's some MBL footage of Rick and his foot restraint uh, bringing that ammonia tank in. Once they get in soft dock, they'll install, install the four bolts that hold it in place, install the two electrical connectors to it, the two nitrogen lines to it, and the two ammonia lines to it. Once they're done with that, uh, they will tran translate back to the forward side of the truss where they left the old ATA, and the arm's going to meet them there. So they'll untie the old ATA from the seat of cart and pick it up and hand it off to the arm. The arms are then going to maneuver the old ATA a little bit inboard, uh, closer to where Rick and Clay left that adjustable grapple bar. So they're going to go untemp stow that, and they will install the adjustable grapple bar onto the old ATA, uh, much like they did with the new ATA on EVA-1. And this will allow the arm to plug the old ATA into the POA and leave it there between EVA-2 and 3. While the arm is plugging the uh, old ATA into the POA, Rick and Clay are going to translate back to ESP2, uh, just outside the airlock. And they're going to grab two debris shields you see flashing in blue. 
These debris shields, the uh, STS-129 crew tied down to the ESP-2. So Rick and Clay are going to untie those, put them in the airlock, and follow those inside to ingress and finish up EVA-2. And between EVAs, uh, the arm's going to walk off once again, go back to Node 2, where it can reach the payload bay. And the primary goal of EVA-3 will be to get that old ATA uh, out of the POA and back and bolted to the LMC, where the new one was launched, and then do a couple other tasks. So if we look at the video for EVA-3. Uh, Rick and Clay will again uh, come out of the uh, joint airlock on EVA-3. And the arm, uh, before they're coming out, while they're coming out, it's going to grab that old ATA out of the POA, and it's going to meet them at ESP-2. And Rick and Clay goes straight to ESP-2, where they're going to take that adjustable grapple bar off the ATA and put it back on the spare FHRC where they got it on EVA-1. So while they're installing that on the FHRC, uh, the arm's going to take that old ATA and maneuver it back to the payload bay. So Clay's going to grab his foot restraint that he left at the end of EVA-1, take it with him, and Rick and Clay will configure themselves around the LMC uh, to put the old ATA onto the LMC for return uh, in the same positions they were in when they took the new ATA off the LMC. So you can see Clay installing the APFR here. He'll get in the foot restraint. Uh, the arm will bring the uh, ATA in close. The crew will take hold of it, bring it down to soft dock, and install the, install the full four bolts that hold it onto the LMC. And, one, and here's some NBL footage of Rick bringing that ATA down to soft dock position. And once they've done that, then we will have successfully installed a new ATA into the S1 truss and have the old ATA on the LMC uh, ready for return and refurbishment. So when they're, when they're done there, Clay's going to grab that fixed grapple bar off the ATA. He's going to put it on his body restraint tether. He'll translate down the payload bay, down the uh, station, and install it on the bottom side of the new ATA that they just installed. They put it here as just a, play, a place to uh, temporarily stow it until it's needed again in the future. So here's some MBL footage of Rick installing that fixed grapple bar onto the bottom side of the new ATA. It's now fully installed and fully activated. So while Rick is doing that, Clay is going to grab his foot restraint off the LMC, and he's going to start setting up to do some tasks on Dexter. So you can see the foot restraint flashing there. And here's a view of what it'll look like outside the cupola windows. And you can see the foot restraint flashing in the background. That's Clay at the LMC. And the arms can start maneuvering to the Columbus module, to the exposed facility on the end of the Columbus. So Clay will grab that foot restraint. And he will translate out to Columbus himself and meet the arm there. And once both Clay and the arm get to the, uh, the Columbus, uh, Clay will install the foot restraint onto the arm. You see the arm meeting him there. And he'll get in that foot restraint, and then he's going to uh, disconnect the lightweight adapter plate assembly, assembly, or LOAPA. The LOAPA is a big plate that we use to hold other things onto the Columbus module. So he'll unbolt it, and the arm's going to fly him back to the payload bay. So here's another view of what that might look like uh, from the cupola windows. You can see the LOAPA flashing in blue. So the arm will fly him, fly Clay in, to, back to the, to the LMC, actually. It's going to fly him upside down, because he's going to bolt the LOAPA to the bottom of the LMC, right underneath where the old ammonia tank is bolted to the top of the LMC. So here's some animation of showing him do that, and here's some MBL footage, of what that looks like with Clay upside down. Uh, bolting the LOAPA in place. Once Clay has completed that task, and Rick will be there helping him get it in place uh, at the LMC, uh, the arm's going to fly uh, Clay over to Dexter, where he's going to install a camera unit. And Dexter has one camera on it right now and has a place for two. So he'll take that camera that's flashing in blue, and he'll install it in the second location. Here's some MBL footage of him installing that camera. It's the white box in his hands. That'll give Dexter two cameras that it can use for future operations. 
Uh, once he's done with that, the arm's gonna fly him up just a little bit where he's gonna remove a thermal blanket off Dexter that's no longer needed. And he'll put that blanket in the bag that he used to carry the camera out there. And once he has that camera installed and the blanket removed from Dexter, the arm will fly him back to the Columbus module where he got on the arm. And he's gonna get off the arm, take his foot restraint off and clean up uh, the arm, make sure it's clear. And he'll take his foot restraint back to Node 2 and install it and leave it there for a future EV crew to use. While Clay is doing these tasks on Dexter, you know, this is a one-person operation, uh, Rick has a few tasks of his own. Uh, he'll be heading back to the lab, the US lab module, and there's a camera on a post on the lab, and that camera has a light on it that just burned out. So Rick's gonna come up to that camera, he's gonna remove the old light and install a new one. See that light flashing there? And here's some MBL footage of Rick installing that light on the camera that's on the post that's on the lab. Once he's done with that, he'll head back to the airlock and he'll put the old light in the airlock and he's gonna grab two more of those radiator grapple fixture stowage beams. So on EVA2, they installed two of those on the port side. Rick will come to the starboard radiator beam, but at the time he'll come to the top side of it and he'll install those two radiator grapple fixture stowage beams uh, himself. Once he's done with that, he will head back to ESP2 where he's gonna grab a worksite extender, worksite interface extender, a WIF extender. This basically is a device that allows us to get more reach with our foot restraints. He's gonna remove it from ESP2 and take it over to the mobile base system and he's gonna install that. And the next flight, STS-132, is gonna use uh, the WIF extender in that location. So this is another get ahead for the next flight to help prepare them. And Rick and Clay should be finishing up about the same time doing all these tasks. So this will, they'll head back to the joint airlock and finish up EVA three and our series of three EVAs. So I'd like to take a moment also to, to thank my team for helping put these EVAs together. They've done a whole lot of work over the last year. Uh, John Malarski and Shelley Mulhern and Sabrina Gilmore, Jordan Lindsay, and Jay Burr have all helped out a whole lot with this. That's all I have. Okay, we'll take some questions from here at the Johnson Space Center first, then we'll go down to the other centers and uh, headquarters. Okay, Gina, anybody over here? Okay, then we'll go to the uh, Kennedy Space Center then in Florida and see if there are questions there. Okay, we'll go to headquarters next then. Thanks, it's, uh, it's Tarek Malik from space.com and Space News, and I, I just had a, a question about the ATA replacement. I'm, I'm just uh, curious if there are any, um, I guess, safety precautions that the spacewalkers have to take care of when they're handling um, the ammonia tank assembly, uh, stuff that they've, maybe they learned from the last ATA replacement, um, and uh, if this old one is gonna be refurbished and flown back to the station again, thanks. <clears throat> Well, they actually did learn a lot from uh, STS-128 that, that did the other ammonia tank. So it's really good to see them do that. It's kind of a nice dry rehearsal for, uh, for our mission. Um, it's a big ORU, so it's very heavy. Uh, we do practice a lot to use foot restraints to get a stable work platform. Uh, the crew is trained to always maintain good, solid control over it. Um, and as far as it being filled with ammonia, uh, the actual, uh, the internal side of it is filled with ammonia but the, uh, the QDs that they operate, the quick disconnects, where they actually, the EV crew interfaces, it it's not, doesn't have ammonia on the back side of that. So uh, it should be pretty safe, uh, nothing too extremely hazardous, but again, it is full of ammonia, so we do take our precautions. Uh, we do have those in place if we need to use them. And, and the old ATA will be flown back uh, for refurbished and refilling with ammonia and flown back on one of the future flights. Okay, I think that's it from NASA headquarters. Bill, you got one? Well, yeah, I'll just ask you a generic uh, uh, question. Bill Harwood, CBS News. Um, 
these don't look like they're overly complex spacewalks, but they're obviously tightly timelined and a lot of interrelated activities. I mean, how do you assess the complexity of it and the, uh, just the overall workload to get all this done? Well, no, that, that's a, a really good assessment. The, the tasks themselves are not very complicated. Uh, we're just basically uh, moving some boxes around and bolting them in place. Uh, but the ammonia tank, it is large. It's 760 pounds, so it's a very large mass. So the EV crew cannot move it by itself. Uh, therefore, we have to use the robotic arm. Um, this involves us using the arm uh, for all three EVAs. And so whenever we tie the arm to the EVA crew, it increases the complexity, especially as far as timeline goes. So we spend a lot of time choreographing things in the MBL and the virtual reality lab to make sure that we are time stuff out to where the arm is not waiting on the EVA crew or the EVA crew is not waiting on the arm too much. So the hardest part will be that correlation between the two. Do, do these EVAs have anything, uh, do you guys have anything in the, in, in the in the bag for get aheads beyond what you told us about, or do you really, or do you think these are going to really fill up the time you got allowed? Uh, we we have a few small get aheads. You know, we're, we're getting towards the end of the shuttle flight, going to station, and towards the end of assembly of station. So um, we actually don't have a whole lot of get aheads, but we have a few in place that we can do uh, at various EVAs. And just one more, uh, just because Rick and Clay have obviously worked together before. Um, does, it, does that help in training, or is it is it something that that was years ago and it's like a different, it's like a new flight and you start from scratch? Oh no, absolutely. I think uh, both of them having experience and both of them having worked before on actual EVAs has been great. Uh, those two from from day one started working together uh, just perfectly. So I think that's a real asset to this flight is their experience and especially their experience together. Okay, over here, Eric. Yeah, Eric Berger with the Houston Chronicle. I think you mentioned that the emotion excuse me, the ammonia tank assembly was roughly the size of a first-generation smart car? Yes. Okay. Roughly. Houston, smart car's a little bigger, ammonia tank's a little heavier. This is Houston, Texas, the uh, petroleum capital of the world. Is that like a VW bug or something? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a small VW bug. Okay. Okay, I think that's it from here. One, okay, Bill's got one more. Just one more Kramer from question from Mark Kramer, our producer up uh, in New York. What, the old MM, MMOD shields, why are they going back in and, and what were they there for in the first place? Uh, those shields were on the airlock. And so when uh, the STS-129 flew up, they took those shields off the airlock and they installed a fifth gas tank okay. on top of the airlock. Okay, so they're just not needed anymore. Right. And they're big, they're hard to fly down, so we're flying them down in the MPLM. That's why they left them for us to do. Thank you. That'll do it. Okay. That's it from here. Uh, that'll wrap up today's briefing. Thanks a lot, Dave. Coming up next here on NASA TV, we will have the B-roll feed, taking a look at all the different animation and uh, video file footage for this upcoming mission. And then coming up at 12 p.m. Central Time, we will have a NASA education overview here on NASA TV. We will bring that to you live from here at the Johnson Space Center. And then at 1 p.m. Central Time, the entire crew of STS-131 uh, will be here to take questions from the media, and we will also broadcast that live here on NASA TV as well. As always, for the latest information on this mission or to learn more, you can always log on to our website at www.nasa.gov. Thanks a lot.